So with that, I would like to turn it over to our panelists. We have three great uh, panelists tonight. Um, Marisol Gamavus is an archeologist that works as a binational wildlands firefighter with the Los Diablos unit. Um, Marisol is a relative newcomer to Tucson, but has years of experience working on forest fires in Mexico and across the US. So we're very interested in kind of that uh, bicultural, binational um, compare contrast of how fires are fought on the ground and then kind of the response that comes afterwards. We're delighted to have her perspective on that. Also with us tonight is Dr. Laura, uh, Laura Marshall who specializes in fire ecology at the U of A's Tree Ring Laboratory researching forest ecology and resilience related to how past disturbances and climate drive uh, changes in the, how climate uh, changes in the forest, drives changes in the forest community, apologize. Uh, interestingly, I knew of Laura as a trail ultra runner and whose mother, Georgia Ellers, was a past board member with WMG. Uh, so it's great to start to develop that connection with her uh, through her, her work as a research ecologist. Um, <clears throat> I did keep seeing Laura's name being mentioned in the news and I was like, I should reach out to her on that. So it was a, a nice connection there. Also with us tonight is Dr. Emily Burns, uh, a program director for the Skyland uh, Alliance, a Tucson-based nonprofit organization focusing on protecting and restoring our unique sky islands that range from northern Mexico across southern Arizona and New Mexico. So Emily has over 15 years of research, conservation, restoration experience. Very interested to learn from Emily the potential impacts from the fire and fires in general, which um, and how they influence our mountain springs and stream systems. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Marisol. Lauren, if you can uh, get those slides screen shared. Nice, Marisol. Well, hi, hi everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I'm so excited. Thank you so much. Uh, I got to make my best for my English. I apologize as I don't have a, a, a good pronunciation, but I, I try my base. Well, um, I am actually a wildlife firefighter. I was working for the last 15 years in archaeology in Mexico. And um, I be involved to the fires, you know, with other different perspectives. And for the beginner, I want to talk, you know, about the fire. And I know we everybody right now, we are concerned about what, what happened in in horn fire, you know, what happened with that um, particular ecosystem. And uh, I want to introduce the fires in two different ways, you know. We always thinking the fire is bad, you know, and we have that image because more the news, we always have uh, uh, the fire destroying everything, you know. I know many families that have a struggle with, um, Load the houses, load the own properties, you know, load the business when the, the fires happens. And I know it's um, bad, but we have the good face to the fire. And we know that, um, and I want to talk about that because uh, I think in the beginner, you know, we, we don't realize how important is the fire and the air. And I hear in, in this image, we have, um, uh, in our cultures, we have uh, the stretch relationship between to the or, uh, elements and the nature. You know, we have the air, we have the earth, the water, and the fire. And all of them, they are together and work together very well. You know, we have um, the next one, please. Well, we have the, here the wheels, um, medicine wheel, and the other image was, well, uh, part of the codice. Uh, for a Mexican codice, that's the mayor, mayor codice. You know, we talking up here for the different elements and the whole work together. And our cultures, we always have an, um, a very close association, you know, a relation, sorry, with, with the fires. Uh, I mean, right now, unfortunately, we lost that relation, you know, with the, our different elements, but 
uh, right now and many other different and uh, many countries you know in south america and africa including you know the recently fires in australia uh, all the cultures they have a very uh, different relation with the fire the fire is part of, the, of nature and we need to understand that uh, concept uh, i mean the next one this is we are here is an uh, actually a, a picture about my own town we have a celebration for the new fire every single year. That means the fire is part of the environment. And I am where I am from, it's a, a very uh, high uh, uh, elevations with pine and ponderosas, you know, and we need uh, to use the fire for manager this uh, forest. We working in different uh, forms and that the more things there are, we are prescribed some fires, you know. We work before the season happens, before the fires come in, you know, before the um, the summer uh, start all the lightings and the fires coming. We need to work before, prevent the fires happen. You know, the next one, please. If somebody have a question, please <laughs> uh, raise your hands. And understand that, you know, I want, um, I want to say the not all the fires they are bad, and we have different ecosystems. The ecosystem depends the water. Other ecosystems depends uh, for fires, and particular you know, or uh, deserts they need a fire too, but in different way. And we need to analogy what kind of ecosystem or, or what where we live, what is around us. You know, the next, the next piece. And, you know, I, I bring the example how we manage it for the agriculture um, uh, uh, farms. And this is an example how we, uh, in Mexico, we work in the slash and burn. It's in a specific system to uh, provide uh, nutrition and to the soil, you know, and um, regeneration for the next year. Um, uh, farmer, corn, or other kind of uh, veggies. And we always have in contact with, with, the, with the fire, but actually, you know, we try to the uh, manager and preserve that a part of our culture and our tradition. When we are, the next one, please. Um, but of course we are now in the city, you know, and I'm sorry, this is, this, um, is a it's in Spanish, but basically I want to say, you know, and in the lower part and the uh, valleys, we have all the uh, the grasses, you know, and the high elevation we have pines, we have different kind of vegetation. The things is their ecosystem work very well together, you know, and when the fires coming or the season fires coming, they are they have adaptation adaptation about them you know it's necessary the fire for regeneration new uh plants and actually the animals need that kind of plants with the fire pass and the the new roads they are coming and one example for that we have the mexican black bear the mexican black bear need um uh, these uh, fires every season because the uh new plants they're coming they are uh, eating that kind of plants and they are ready for have all the uh, nutrition and changes they need for uh, a winter, you know, and for half a new cups. But here in this uh, graphic, we are transform our ecosystem means now we are in the in the valley in Tucson, you know, and that means um, uh, the the plants and the animal chain a little bit, but uh, probably Laura, maybe she she manager better that um, topic. But I want to say, you know, it's very important understand where we live, where it's around us, and how the fire work in the good way. Oh, we of be a wildland fire fire. My work is not only put down the fires, you know. I need to provide all the information to do the public for they understand better how manager the fires. You know, that's very important part of my job. job. Uh, the next, please. 
And you know that that part who manager the fires, they we need the prescription fires. That is make uh, the plan before the season happen, you know, and uh, working with the fuels and reduce the vegetation when we uh, have um, when we don't have fires for for uh, many seasons and in the forest. Uh, when when we um, you know, we have this idea, every single fire we need to stop and and that's probably not the best way to do, you know. Um, the next, the next one, please. And how we can work into our own places, you know, uh, many, many of us, we think in, oh, the fires is more close to us. And the reality is, we are more close to the areas the fire the, the is the natural uh, fire and i mean you know we are um, the cities they are big uh, coming growing 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 and we are more close to the, the that areas and of course we love live to close uh, areas surrounding to the beauty vegetation and trees and things but we hope we need to um Contrarrestar, como se dice? Contrarrestar. I mean, we need to uh, work in our own space, you know, and prevent that fires uh, be close to our properties. You know, that's, that's a very important thing to do uh, part to the manager the fires before the season. No, it's only fight, 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 fight with the fires, you know, it's prevent. And no, it's only a uh, result to the problems after the fires, you know, we can manage it uh, in the beginner and after that. And one big example about this is how um, we need to make our buffers close to our house, you know, and that is 30 feet means clear all the vegetation. I know we love to have a shade and close to the, our houses, but we have a, a different kind of vegetation we can put that are more shorter and eliminate the big um, uh, uh, vegetation close to our, our, our property or, or business or whatever is that. Um, and the next one, I think so, or I think it's in. Yeah, I think it's in. <laughs> I mean, I want to. I want to say, uh, we need to learn about or the good phase for the fire. Another thing is uh, we need to um, uh, thinking if maybe we go is the is the summer. You know, the time of the summer, and we want to um, enjoy the the forest, or we we like to camping. We need to be alert. What is our uh, what what happened in the environment? You know, if big big winds, you know, uh, prefer to uh, make a, a fire. You know, if uh, you can bring your meals a different form, that's a good option. You know, uh, try to be um, uh, concerned about what can happen with. We have 100 degrees. You know, it's uh, it's important uh, manage it in that in that in that way. <laughs> Thank you, Marisol. Thank you for um, definitely emphasizing the cultural aspect of our relation to fire and also our relation to the mountain um, from down here in the valley as well as when we recreate. That's very important to remember. Um, <clears throat> next up, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Laura, Dr. Laura Marshall. Laura, I'm not sure if you've been seeing all the questions coming through the chat, but I think a lot of them you'll be able to answer um, in your brief presentation and also when we get into the discussion later. Um, but just seeing everybody's questions coming through and, and we will be getting to those, but I think some of them may be answered in some of these uh, upcoming slides. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as Mariel, Marisol showed, uh, there is a, a big range of species and habitat types as you move up in the mountains. And I'm gonna try and place the bighorn fire in the context of past fire, how we know what fire was like in the past and how natural it was for at least the pine forests and the Catalinas, which is an area I'm particularly concerned with, you know, is that's the, the great place, all the great places to go are up there basically. Um, 
So here we see just some examples of different uh, scenes you might see as you go up the Catalinas or up to now, uh, from the grasslands in the bottoms to uh, we have some of the most southerly populations of corkbark fir in um, that species range, basically, which uh, from what I hear did survive the fire. So, um, but a lot of the forests are basically ponderosa pine, which we know historically uh, has adapted to fire through thick bark, uh, self pruning branches, uh, and is basically adapted to live with fire as a natural part of its uh, life cycle. Can we move forward. So here uh, are three views of ponderosa pine. And the top one is kind of what we might consider a historic ponderosa pine forest, fairly open space trees, grassy understory. Um, but if you remove fire from that landscape, you get something much more like the bottom. So you'll have a big growth of ponderosa pine seedlings at some point. Seedling pine regeneration does tend to be uh, climate related. So when you have a period that's relatively cooler and wetter, those seedlings are more likely to grow. Uh, obviously that's getting harder and harder now, especially in the last 20 years or so, which I believe there was a, a mention in the chat. And whether or not pines can come back into these areas is really dependent on getting a big, decent moisture pulse that can let them sprout. Um, but of course, if they sprout in the absence of fire, they'll just grow up and all those fuels uh, will lead to much more severe fire, much greater kill off of the large trees and greater watershed effects. Uh, so we can move forward. So how do we know what a natural fire regime is? We do that uh, through fire scar sampling, which of course I learned at the tree ring lab. This is um, some field sampling on one of my projects in New Mexico here. Uh, so we have a worker cutting into a scarred stump and that's uh, the face that we're looking at is called a cat face, which is basically Someone thought it looked like a cat <laughs> at some point in the past, but what it is is if fire came through it in the past, scarred that tree while it was still living, um, but didn't kill it. So the tree was able to start to grow back around and create a curl. And a few years later, maybe a decade or two, fire came through again and scarred the tree, but didn't kill it. So it just grew another curl. And it keeps doing this over and over until, in this case, someone came along and cut it down, uh, which is not great. <laughs> but um, it does leave a really great record on the landscape for us to come along and figure out what happened in the past. So on the right, well, once you have that fire scar sample, how do you know when it's from? Because yeah, trees often put on one ring a year, it's cross uh, tree ring dating. Um, but what's more important is the pattern of the rings. So you get wider or smaller rings, generally if it's a wetter or cooler year, um, Wetter, cooler is a wider year. In hot and dry, you get a narrower year ring. And um, sometimes it's so hot and dry that the tree won't form a ring at all, um, or just not one that on the spot you sampled. So once you know that pattern, you can look between trees and match up that pattern, which will be the same across the landscape and often a state even, uh, and really find out exactly once you know the outside date of say a living tree that you cored, um, you can basically count back and match up the pattern to the deadwood and move back and back in time to build up hundreds of years of a chronology. And by matching where those fire scars happen, you can see when fire was present on the landscape burning this tree exactly in the past. And if you look very closely, a fire scar will burn into a very a particular spot in a ring, either when the ring is dormant, the tree hasn't started growing yet for that year, or after the tree started growing. It'll, and, um, just by looking at that, you can get down to seasonality, at least whether it's an early spring, early summer fire, midsummer, later in, in the fall. And so that gives us a very detailed look at what fire was doing in the past on the landscape. Move forward. So and this is what you get as the sum of all those little curls and fire scar and counting rings. This is a composite chronology uh, from Tom Swetnam who uh, was a former director of the Tree Ring Lab and did a lot of the fire history work in Southern Arizona and New Mexico. Um, and here you see, it's, well, it's a composite strictly from the Catalinas. So, and it's from basically three different areas of pine forest in the mountain up on the top in the mixed conifer, the area around Rose Canyon Lake and also in Bear Canyon. Um, and you can see, we go back using the dinner chron chronology method into the 1500s 
So that's um, a pretty good stretch of time. That's probably the oldest living trees on the mountains probably go back to the 1700s possibly. Um, but by looking for fire scarred trees, they're a little more particular. You have to go back uh, and look at the deadwood to move back that far. Um, and where these lines end uh, on the right are individual uh, trees or sites that have fire scarred uh, sections. And the thick bar black lines going up and down the page are fires that spread across the landscape. So they hit multiple sites in the same year. So we don't know for sure if all those lines that match up in a given year are from the same event. They could be from multiple smaller fires. Um, or they could be one big spreading fire like we see in the Bighorn Fire. Yeah, yeah, so there's um, some particular years uh, highlighted at the bottom where it says composite are the very big major fire years uh, that are probably weather driven events. So when it's hotter and drier, following a wetter, cooler year is when you get the really big events. So the wet, cool year allows the grass and the seedlings to grow up, fire comes through and can just spread. And the other really distinct feature of the fire history of the Catalinas is basically fire exclusion. After about 1900, you stop having those big spreading events. Uh, you do get occasional isolated events. You can see a couple of little lines in there and one, uh, one, in, one on the composite, yeah, <laughs> in 2020. Um, 1985, that one in particular was a prescribed burn in Rose Canyon that the Forest Service has good records on and it shows up in the tree ring record just as you hope it would. Uh, so we can, from that and other similar uh, research, we can be fairly certain that the historic fire scar record is accurate, basically. Of fairly excellent records back in time through the Forest Service and also um, much more burning just because it's a lot harder to get up there and put out fires. And that's really what happened in 1900. So once, um, basically in 1910, there was a really bad fire year uh, and everybody decided fire is bad. We need to put it out without considering that it's natural to these systems. So we got really good at putting out fire and also it was a relatively cool wet period. Uh, so you get a lot of the seedling establishment and less tendency towards spreading fire at all. So it's fire is much easier to put out. Um, and that allows all those fuels and seedlings to grow up and grow up and grow up and not get consumed, just get denser and denser. So what had been a relatively open forest just gets torched when you get a spark. Um, so we can move forward and try not to take up too much time. Uh, but here's um, some of those uh, black bars from the last page map spatially. This is the Rose Canyon area in the Catalinas. And you can see every decade or two, there was probably a major spreading fire in the mountains, but it probably burned through the summer, similar to the Bighorn, um, but tended to stay relatively low and probably overall had relatively low fire impacts. Um, given that these are fairly open ponderous the pine forests historically. Can move forward. Okay, and uh, by looking at the fire scar positions again, we can see that a lot of these fires, just in terms of area burned, uh, were fires that happened in June, like the Bighorn. Um, and that's because it's a lot hotter and drier in that month. So when you do get lightning, as we saw, uh, it can just spread and spread. July, you see a lot more ignitions from lightning, but the area, total area burn tends to be much lower. Move forward. So this is uh, from Forest Service data. I was mentioning their good records. Uh, so these are all the known fires in the Catalinas from 1921 to 1999. Obviously they're, you know, it's not nothing. It's uh, even uh, not as drastic as the uh, Rose Canyon chronology showed where you do have a few fires, but they tended not to spread. And um, if you know the habitats around here, it's mostly kind of in the woodlands and grasslands, kind of at mid elevations. There's a couple of fires higher up in the pines, um, but not too many. And a lot of that's because a lot of these fires were put out very quickly once they started. Can move forward. Now, after 99, obviously something changed. And a lot of that has to do with the weather and that buildup of fuels. So when you have enough fuels and you have hot, dry conditions, when you do get a, a fire start, 
it's a lot more likely to just go. And we've seen that in the Aspen fire and the Bullock fire in 2002, 2003, which together burned um, most of the mountain range. And not even 20 years later, uh, 15 or so, we see the whole mountain range burn again with the uh, Bighorn fire. So move forward, I think I'm almost done here. And um, just to get another view on how, how natural or unnatural that uh, Bighorn fire has been. This is a fire severity map I, I developed that's very close to the bear fire severity uh, map because it's based off the same data. Um, and you see what's a little concerning is uh, the red up at high elevations. That's relatively high severity that um, where it's burning through pine forest is going to cause substantial ecosystem change. That's the areas that you're more likely to lose trees. Uh, in the low and moderate, um, it's a lot more mixed. You may or may not have local stand effects, um, but in the high severity patches is more likely loose trees, get the hydrophobic soils like Kathleen mentioned and just um, see ecosystem change basically to move forward. I think I'm, I'm almost done with my slides. You can move on if, if you need to. Just stop me, I can talk about this all day. <laughs> uh, so here's uh, as close to a comparison before or after as I could get looking at my pictures. So this is up on Radio Ridge, looking out into the wilderness of rocks on the left in 2017, and I was probably on a, a run. And on the right uh, is a photo from Interweb, from the Bighorn Fire crew, basically. And I don't know how well the colors come through over the internet, but basically you're looking out into a lot of scorched trees that may or may not survive. Um, we won't know that until we get out and actually put some plots in and uh, sam take some samples. Basically, that's a, a part of what Bear will be doing. Um, or, and uh, I'm involved with some groups at the U of A that are trying to get uh, some research funds to go out and see the actual effects on the landscape. Um, so hopefully we can do some of that and see what the actual impacts will be. But if you move forward, you can see this is um, another one from Summerhaven looking up towards Marshall Saddle and Radio Ridge. And I included it because it shows an area that burned very severely in the Aspen Fire. Uh, the Aspen Fire started uh, just in that area and came roaring into Summerhaven. And as we know, burnt hundreds of houses along with much of the older mixed conifer forest on top of the mountain. And what that did was remove a lot of the fuels in that area. Uh, and I think when the fire burned back into this area, uh, back on the fire severity map, um, it was more mixed. So some low, some moderate, some patches of high, um, but generally it didn't completely consume everything. And the firefighters were able to stop the fire before it got back into Summer Haven. And a lot of why I think that was possible was the previous loss in the Aspen fire. So we move forward. Mm -hmm. And what's gonna come next? I think as uh, mentioned in the chat and I mentioned earlier, without a wet, wet, you know, wet period and seed trees, you don't get more pines on the landscape. You're a lot more likely to get oak and grass, depending on whether or not there's oak in a system. It's a re-sprouter and will sprout early and fast and uh, take up all the space before the pines get a chance. So if you like oak, uh, it's, it'll be pretty great after the bighorn. <laughs> and some of those severe patches were areas that had already transitioned to oak or possibly were oak previously before the Aspen fire. Um, but you can expect those patches to expand following the bighorn. And um, ideally with re getting reasonable amounts of fire in the landscape at appropriate times, uh, you can kind of push the landscape more towards resilience and the more open pine with grass understory landscape. Um, but that all depends on avoiding the big severe climate, you know, weather driven fire events that would just burn up everything. So I think um, I can end there. Uh, Great, thank you very much, Laura. That was a lot of information um, packed into there. And I know you have a lot more that you could provide. Um, <clears throat> we're starting, we do have a range of questions about the bear program and the bear response and the, I know even before that, like what were the resources being provided um, to fight the fire early on? Just kind of thinking about as we move um, and we transition to Emily, uh, Emily, I believe you're gonna just talk a little bit about the bear response, but then also if you can just kind of touch on what is the potential for evaluating the bear response uh, post-fire to kind of have those lessons learned 
I think we can start to answer some of the questions that are being asked. Thanks, Laura. Emily? Oh, we may have to unmute uh, Emily Lauren because she had to rejoin. Or I, I think can you, do it. you can do that, Kala. Yeah. Thank you. There we go. I almost forgot. It may be, uh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> It'll be easier for me to communicate with you all if I can, if I can speak to you. So this is good. All right. If we could go ahead to my next, to my first slide. Okay, great. Um, well, it's nice to speak with you all. I know that um, like many of you, I'm based here in Tucson and watched the fire burn. It seemed like for day after day, just kept going. Um, I took this photograph on Tuesday um, from my neighborhood looking up and seeing some rain coming down onto the mountains. And this is of course, both a wonderful thing for us as we're desperate for our monsoon rains to come. And it generates so many questions about what's gonna be happening in this watershed to our mountains and how is it gonna affect those of us down at lower elevations. Um, here below the Santa Catalina Mountains. What I'm gonna to talk to you about briefly in my introduction here is just thinking conceptually about how we move past the reality of being in triage mode, dealing with fires as a crisis, and how to think very holistically about our sky and mountain ranges and how we can be stewarding them. Um, we need to do right by the Santa Catalina Mountains, given the condition they're in now, and we need to be thinking about a, a restoration mindset. But we also are surrounded in Tucson by other Sky Island mountain ranges where we have opportunities to do more preventative work, do restoration to bring fire back and to do other treatments to help make sure they're going to be more resilient as more intense fires come. And I think everything that, that Laura has just shared just is a very good wake up call about the kind of stand replacing fires that can happen now because of climate change and, and other issues. Next slide, please. So I, I just wanna set the vision of what good looks like for us at this point in time. We know climate is changing. We know that so much is changing in our mountains and in the watershed and the ecosystems. But I think we all probably can agree that we want to prevent this type of new catastrophic fire from eliminating the habitats that we really care about, the forests that we love. We wanna slow the rate of change that our skylands are experiencing so we can give the species and the places that we love the best chance they can have to adapt to our changing world. Um, and that's gonna require public and private partnerships to be taking care of these ecosystems and make sure, making sure we're doing everything we can to sustain them into the future. And we wanna be there, we wanna enjoy our sky islands. Um, there, there really are that summer haven for us. So how, how, how do we do that? And I wanna talk a little bit about this. Next slide. So one of the things that's so wonderful about skylands and these mountain ranges in general is this idea that they are capturing water for us. Mountains are absorbing water at, when it comes down either as rain or as snow and the best functioning watersheds are doing this like a sponge. They are slowing the pace of water. They're allowing water to infiltrate down into the mountains and we wanna get that water into the aquifers. Now this is so important because clearly we are depending on aquifer water to sustain our communities down here um, in Tucson, but we need that to be a reliable water source and we cannot do that unless we have a watershed above us, these mountains and forests and habitats absorbing that water. This simple schematic here is just showing um, as you go up an elevation in a mountain, different routes that path uh, that water droplets can take as they're moving through the mountains. And in the Sky Islands, water can go down into the aquifer and then be pumped back out. If it's slow and the mountains are acting like a sponge, it will come out slowly and streams um, and creeks and rivers and flow down an elevation. And they, it also comes back out uh, in springs. And springs are places that my organization, Sky Island Alliance, is really focused on because they're unique habitats that provide higher elevation mountain water in places where there isn't necessarily a perennial creek or stream. Next slide. 
So here's a photo from the Chiricahua Mountains after the 2011 Horseshoe Fire. And I put this in here because we're starting to think about how has our watershed function changed because of the fire that's gone across 100 and about 120,000 acres. So the things that we're concerned about, we're concerned about the fact that we've had loss of vegetation. And clearly Laura has showed some photographs of what that can look like if, this, if the pine trees are removed, if the forest um, is, is completely um, torched. So we worry about the loss of vegetation and there are a lot of ecoly, ecological impacts of that from not having food sources for wildlife to losing flora and fauna. So there's acute concerns with that. But our vegetation is also helping keeping soil up in our mountains. So the loss of vegetation can cause soil to erode and sediment to slip. The soil also can become what we call hydrophobic. Um, it can become water resistant following a fire, meaning that it's slick, it's a slick surface. And instead of water infiltrating, remember this, the sponge concept, instead of that water getting into the mountains, it can just run down really quickly. And with a lot of weight and water traveling quickly and loss of vegetation, we can have this sort of major severe erosion event, which we don't, we don't wanna have happen. We don't want our mountains to be crumbling around us. So acutely, we're very concerned about stabilizing areas in, in the Catalina Mountains where we know, once we know where the highest impacted areas are, we wanna stabilize the soil and the sediment. Um, and we wanna do that not only because we wanna protect ourselves from floods, but we need to get back to increasing that infiltration of water back into our system. Because if we lose a lot of water with flooding now, of course, there's the short-term impact of us being affected by floods. But for many years to come, we will be losing the chance to recharge our aquifers, which is also a really big concern for us. Next slide, please. So here's a photograph um, from the Arizona Daily Star that I saw that sort of similar to what um, Laura showed, shows areas of, of higher intensity burn where it looks like there's no green left. This is um, up on Mount Lemmon. And then there are some areas of continued green on the landscape. And so, you know, we can look at this as the mountain half full or half empty. Do, do we lose so much vegetation? I look at this and I say, but there's also places where the vegetation wasn't burned. And that patchiness where we see high intensity and low intensity fire means there's chances for habitat to be maintained. There's seed sources for plants to reestablish. These are these anchors up on our mountain that we need to go and survey and look for so that we can build out around them, protect them, and help to use those places um, to rehabilitate the severely burned places on the fire, uh, on the mountain. Now, I have on here just a little bit that I can that I can share with you about the burned area emergency response. This is a program that the Forest Service uses um, to deal with the a, the second crisis that comes along with a major wildfire like the Bighorn. So the first step, and it's already been discussed, is working to contain the fire and deal with the actual fire management issues while it's burning. But even before that containment hits, the Forest Service moves into this bear planning process. And they start with assessing um, the values of concern. And they've made a long list. I've heard they have more than 200 points of concern that they're worried about. And the goal with the BEAR program is to prevent those cascading next emergencies that threaten infrastructure and human life. So don't look at the BEAR to say it's gonna fix the ecology of the mountain. That's, that's beyond the scope of what this program can do. It is emergency response funding to help stabilize critical areas um, that could be a direct threat to basically human life or um, important property. So what does that entail? That is things like, that entails things like um, stormproofing roads and crossings so that we don't lose access um, up on the mountain. Um, it's looking at uh, stormwater patrol, getting people out on the ground to look at where major flood flooding events um, could, be get could begin um, and monitoring for the impacts of those right away. It's putting signs up and gates up. Um, it's really about making sure that people are safe and it's collaborating with a lot of other agencies down the mountain, um, like the flood control district and trying to figure out how they can take measurements at the top of the mountain to have an earlier warning system about where the flooding could be the worst. So I'll just pause for a second while we get the slides back. 
Yes, uh, we seem to have lost Lauren, so I've started sharing my screen. Um, can you see my screen now, everybody? Yes. Well, I, yes, I can see our 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 document, shared document. Okay. Oh, you can't see the. Oops. Did I choose the wrong thing? Sorry about that. Lauren, what happened to you? There we go. I chose the wrong one. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. So if you could go to the next slide when you have a moment. Is that so correct? The, uh, that's fine, yeah. The the bear process, it's, it's just in the first phase right now. They've just begun to do um, an initial assessment and they're beginning to mobilize resources. There are very tight limitations to what the bear funding can be spent on. So I know I went to them and I said, I've got great ideas. Let's use, let's do this under the bear program. And I was rightfully told, no, that's not what the funding's for. For example, invasive species only fit under a bear plan if it is evaluating the direct likelihood of spreading of invasives where the fire was being, um, was being fought. So if they cut in a fire line, they can go back and survey to see if invasive species um, are at risk there. It's not going to deal with older infestations of invasive species on the landscape. So that's just something for us um, all to understand. And we have a lot, um, there's a lot that the Forest Service still needs to assess. They haven't been able to access major areas of the Catalinis yet um, for safety issues. So there's still a lot more information to gather even about how they're going to be um, completing the, the assessment plan. Okay, so that's, you know, that's the limitation of the system that we're in. Um, um, if you could go back a slide, please. So that's a limitation of what we're, what we're dealing with, but we can continue to think big picture about what it is that we can do on the landscape as a community to rally around the Forest Service and to join forces um, as, as a community, as a group of nonprofits, as an academic community that want to see natural and cultural resources restored on the Catalina Mountains. And what, like I mentioned before, those areas of green <laughs> in these in these um, burn photos, to me, are very symbolic of the kind of things that we need to go and find and survey and build out from those places. And it's a real bright spot of hope. I don't know if you're like me, but I look at some of the devastation and the idea of losing some of these forests, and it's absolutely heartbreaking. And that is absolutely true. And the next thing I need in my life is to find the, the bright spots and the, and the part of hope um, that we can find find on the mountain and there are going to be many of those places. So I, I highlight this and I don't know how well you're able to see the photograph. Um, but this is a, a this is a spring from a different Sky Island range from the Pinaleños, High Cienega Spring. And during a previous fire, it was a refuge during that fire because it had a higher moisture. Um, it was a place that didn't have the high severity that the coniferous forest did around it. And so we are really gonna be looking to see if springs and other places that have moist habitat are that kind of refuge for wildlife and native plants um, in the Catalinas during the Bighorn Fire and in the aftermath. So that's pretty interesting. Next slide. Um, great. And so here's an image from the a spring that was only barely affected um, by the Aspen fire that burned through the Catalinas. And this spring um, what had very little vegetation loss. And again, it was one of those places that really fared fairly well during the previous fire. And so we're going to be going out and looking for those places that may be in the best condition because those are going to be some of the best places that we have left. And it, wildlife species are very mobile. They move around. They have adaptations to go underground, small ones, um, as a fire burns through. And when they come back out, they're going to be looking for places where habitat is still intact. And um, we can help them by creating more habitat bridges and doing that restoration work around the best quality habitat that's left on the mountain. Next slide. Okay, I'm only seeing a portion of the slide, so I don't know if that's on my computer or not. Um, but this is a, a slide that is 
is just sharing with you that we are launching a new effort and we hope you'll join us um, when it's safe to go and visit the mountains. Um, this Catalina's again, but also can be done in other areas on Coronado National Forest, where you can help us collect data on the condition of springs, either in unburned areas or in burned areas so that we can identify where we have those most valuable habitats that we want to make sure are most protected because they're more important than ever now because the fire burned through and also identify these places, these habitats where they're at risk from erosion. The idea of sedimentation that could happen um, if the hill slopes start to slip. We don't want to have these really critical water sources being covered up and blanketed um, after the fire. So there's things we can do like putting in, and this is something that Watershed Management Group excels at, putting in loose rock structures um, to help prevent siltation into springs. We can look at doing habitat um, enhancements as well around these places. So Spring Seeker, um, happy to share more information. It looks like it's been added to the chat. So if you wanna go and read about it or download it to your phone, it's a simple survey. You don't need to be an expert that you can just carry with you when you're hiking in the future. Um, and it's, it'll just talk you through a few questions to look at the spring you come across or any other water source you come across when you're hiking in the mountains. So um, I hope that's great for you. You've got a lot of training resources on our website.